Okay, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good evening. Hi, everyone. If you can put in your comment line that you can hear us and see us, that would be great. We are broadcasting on LinkedIn and on YouTube. Yeah, we yeah, will find this live on my, I, I check it on my phone. Friends, <laughs> Link, LinkedIn, you know, okay. Perfect, yeah. That's Our friend idea. from from Finland, Mika is here. Good evening from Finland. Good, good evening to Finland. So there are people coming in, in in LinkedIn. So if somebody from LinkedIn can put also in the comments that you can see us and hear us, it looks like it, everything should be fine because I see it on my you know phone. So first of all, thanks very much for being with us in such you know tough time for the human you know kind. Uh, we were, you know, deeply thinking whether we should do it or not. But at the end of the day, we said, because Lisa is Swiss American, I'm Czech origin. We help people who needed our, you know, help already. And, you know, all people suffering from this, you know, uh, big uh, issue uh, and humanitar humanitarian catastrophe are all deeply in our hearts. But we think that we should you know continue to do what we do the best share with you some of our you know ideas and you know strengthening you and strengthening us in this you know tough time so i don't know Lisa, if you want to add something i think you summarize it so nicely i mean what's so important to us is this shows how much we need compassionate kind leadership the type of leadership where we can work together where we learn how to communicate properly i mean this is what we stand for right this is what we're trying to say how do we be positive leaders how do we have positive influences on people and so for us to have this show is our way of contributing to creating the leadership and creating the world that we really want to see and of course our hearts go out there um, to everyone who's suffering on all, you know, on all, yeah, just everyone and knowing that the world is coming together in a way that I, for me, I've never seen it. Right. I mean, we stand up strong. We're there. How can we help immediate impact? We want to be there for each other. It's actually beautiful. Yeah. All right, so uh, Lisa picked up today interesting team, and it's about taking risk. Uh, whether you are in sport, business, art, I think this is, you know, really important. And uh, I'll kick it off, and uh, I will look into our, in the human, you know, history. In the, in the past, you know, people didn't have that many choices, right? They were, like, hunting, they were eating, they were having a rest, they were hunting, eating, having a rest. Uh, so there was not that much, you know. Then, obviously, as we develop, there was so many other things. And today, you have so many choices. So as a matter of the fact, our, you know, attention and our ability to decide and also to take some pragmatic risk is lower than, than before. That's quite, you know, clear, right? This is interesting, you know, study, what, what Amy Cuddy did at Stanford. She figured out if, you know, you as a human being, whether you are artist or, you know, businessman or, you know, uh, some athlete, if you straight, if you stay straight, you're like, it's, it's called, you know, uh, power posing, your, you know, uh, testosterone goes up by 20%. Your cortisol, which is the stress hormone, your amygdala goes down by 25%. But what is most important relative to the risk, your ability to risk goes up by 33%. So, and, and the, the, why is that? Because obviously our ability to risk is influenced by our emotions, okay? Yeah. If, if you feel good, if you are like curious, there, there can be some different, you know, right? You, you put there like sleep at a stranger house, Airbnb, <laughs> right? In the stranger's car, Uber, you know, right? Those people were very curious because, I mean, if, if, you, if you take a risk in your life, you always are taking this question. Can, we, can I do it differently or can we do it, you know, differently, right? The, the, this is it. And I, and I think somehow while, while we are kids, we risk a lot because, you know, whenever you like, when you are like falling down, trying to walk, it's a huge risk to fall down again and again and again. But this is it. But 
once we are like getting, you know, adult, there's a less and less ability to risk because we are less and less curious, right? Yes. And, and also, here's the thing, Jan. I mean, most of us don't realize. So actually, I'm going to tell everyone a secret. I hate the word risk. Unless mm. you are in compliance or you're really looking at finances, I don't like the word risk. The, the word that I actually use is audacity. Right. Because audacity in English, it's like you have to like be a little bit adventurous and a little bit almost like cheeky. Like, I can't believe you did that. But in a positive way, not mm -hmm. really in like a, you know, in a hurtful way, but yes. in a way where you're just very bold. And that's what I think everybody should be doing. Because here's the thing. I think we as adults, we just get scared. We've been, as a child, you don't know. You don't think about the repercussions of things you do. As an adult, you know, ooh, I'm going to get in trouble. Ooh, I'm going to look stupid. Ooh, I'm going to lose my money for my business if I do that. So we can see what bad can happen. And we want to you know, save ourselves from all of the harm, hurtful emotions that we're going to feel. Um, and it's just the opposite of what we actually need to feel alive. And for me, this is the biggest topic of all, no matter who I coach, no matter what we're talking about, at some point, this level of audacity, this willingness to take something big on has to come up because it is literally the thing that is the difference Absolutely. between successful people and these superstars who are skyrocketing. I don't know about you, Jan, when I'm coaching, I mean, I, you know, I, I met, I, I'm here in Dubai. I, I mentioned last week, I'm here in Dubai for five weeks. I took 10 weeks off, by the way, not off, but away from the yeah. home, took my kids yeah. out of school for 10 weeks, five weeks, Dubai, five weeks, New York. I'm doing business development, meeting new people in these new locations, thinking about expanding the business. And everybody was like, are you, are you crazy? You can't just like take your kids out of school. And it's like, really? Because I just filled out a piece of paper and asked and everyone said yes. And it was fine. And everybody's fine, right? But we put these limitations on ourselves. We think I can't, or that's not the way things are, or isn't it too hard? Or isn't that too, what if they fall behind? We're always looking for risks, risks, risks. Instead, open up to opportunities and possibilities. Yeah, and very often, what what can help you? <laughs> because what what Lisa uh, was talking about, it's called in psychology negative bias. Okay, mm -hmm. our brain tries to find out what can go wrong, basically, right? Because your amygdala, the emotional part of the brain, is five to ten times faster than your you know neocortex. But now, now the, the question is, how can I overcome like the initial you know doubts or whatever initial fear? Okay. It is good to take a paper and say, hey, those are pros and those are the cons, you know, and this is the risk. Because once it's on the paper, you know, right, you, you realize, hey, there is a there's a great opportunity. Maybe it's challenging situation, but the opportunity is fascinating. I can and I can tell you, I left Microsoft when I was absolutely at the peak of my, you know, performance career, whatever. I was 53 years old. And a lot of journalists said, you are absolutely crazy. You've got very well paid job, you know, president of Microsoft or Europe, whatever. But my heart was somewhere else already. This is it. I, I was like, hey, yeah. you know, you cannot play, you know, NHL or, you know, uh, Premier League in soccer for 30 years yeah. or 25 years. And it's the same in the in the business. And I, it was a it was a little bit less risky for me because obviously, I've got, you know, some savings, whatever, you know, right? But on the other hand, it was a huge risk. And what I do now, it's like 60% very new. I teach kids. I didn't do that, you know, when I was in Microsoft. I'm like a coach, mental coach for one of the best, you know, athletes in the world, you know, right? But it is about curiosity and taking the first step. There is a, another, another study which they did at Harvard. If you are able, and if you are like doubtful, right, full of the doubts, and if you are able to do at least four steps ahead, like physical steps ahead, your level of stress goes down by 40 percent. Hmm. Huge, you know, right? Because yep. your you know, physicality, your body is connected with your with, with your mind, you know, right? So th this is it. Obviously, I mean, it needs to be calculated as you should not be crazy. But still, <laughs> 
the issue is that our brain doesn't like changes. That's why we hate risk, basically, right? Unless your brain is trained, and the best training is to be curious, you know, to be like, hey, can it be, as you said, can can it, in this situation, it's a very challenging situation, but can can there be some good, you know, positive message? What can I learn from that situation? And maybe there is some opportunity. In Chinese, you know, challenge means opportunity, basically, right? You know, that's that's what I said always during the last uh, financial crisis. Yes, and this is this is again what makes the difference between people who are very successful and people who are, you know, doing all yep. right. They're playing not to lose. I want to keep what I have. I'll go step by step. I'll go very incremental. I'll make sure it's safe. Right? It's like dipping your toes in the water. Exactly. But you got to see the opportunities, the people who really are here to change the world. And I'm in Dubai where, you know, it's very future oriented. They're really trying to money, be cutting. Money is not an issue in Dubai. <laughs> well, look, they're willing to invest it, right? But they're but also... What is, what like I, I, I used to work when I was in Microsoft. I used to work as a great lady. She's a part of the government in Dubai. Sheikha Lubna. She was a minister of economy. I don't know if she's still there, but... but what she told me, she said that already in 2007, 2008, Dubai was only like 9 to 10 percent dependent on oil. That was the like long term vision. We want to be like Internet City and all like knowledge worker, you know, society, stuff like that, to be less dependent on natural resources. What well, That's what they did, you know. To be fair. But that's that's what they're doing. So what they said is we're going to look, we're going to build to the future. So what's our vision? What can we create? The entire like Dubai, mm -hmm. you know, area has been imagined and then they've built it and created it. They've actually designed it. So th this is what it means to say, don't just sit back and take what you have and then say, I have to protect, right? Could have done that with oil. We have oil, we have money, you know. But instead, we're going to be expansive. And here's the biggest thing that people don't get. We limit ourselves. We're the ones who say, I can't, I shouldn't, couldn't possibly. I could point out a thousand times. I'm a coach, right? I should know better. <laughs> I can tell you a thousand times when I've limited myself and someone else has said to me, oh, you should do this. And I'm like, oh, me? Couldn't. And then it's like, wait, why not? right? We need to constantly be opening up the question, not why me, why not me? Why shouldn't Perfect. I do that, right? And go from that opportunity perspective. Why wouldn't I do this? Why not? Why shouldn't I? Like, you know, I go for the default of this could be fun and interesting and exciting. And I could learn a whole lot. This is something Jana also talks about very often with growth mindset. We have to not be set on it needs to be perfect and I need to get the exact result I wanted. No, but you are curious. I'm here to learn. I'm here to develop my skills as an entrepreneur, as an athlete, as a whatever, as a business person. I'm here to learn. I'm here to explore. I'm here to figure out something new. When you keep that mindset for every opportunity, the skills that you grow, right? If you're stacking skills, you're that much better than everyone else. And if you, it, I was just coaching, you know, before this, I, I've got like one football player, one uh, canoeing, you know, guy and, and lady, she's a swimmer, you know, right? Two athletes. And uh, uh, it is clear that if you concentrate on the journey, on your own performance, what you can influence. That's what the Stoics said. It's cooling down also your amygdala. So you are not that much nervous or stressful. You just concentrate one present moment after the other on your you know, journey. And you try to be best version of yourself like every day, every you know, day. That's that's what you do. What, what you said, Lisa, about you know, like good performers and some legends. Okay, I think. In the life, it goes like, hey, this is your, you know, expectation. This is your reality, okay? Those people who, who got, like, fixed mindset, they are lowering. If they are not succeeding, they are lowering their expectations, okay? Yeah. Good performers, they try to put their reality, you know, in harmony with their expectations. The real legends, like Michael Jordan, you know, right? And others, they, they do this, you know. 
They go, you know what I mean? They go up with the reality, but they are also hiring the expectations. That's why Mike Phelps, 26, you know, golden medals at the Olympic Games, you know, right? And and etc. This is it. They they really try to push the limit. That's why, I mean, what whoever I work with, my slogan is always aim to the moon. If you miss the moon, you will still end up among the stars. This is it. This yes. is the this is the right mindset because you never know how long you will, you know, go on your you know journey, how much you can you know reach unless you try. The problem is amygdala is don't try. What don't if try. what if it's FOPO? Fear of other people's opinion, you know, right? And very often, like in my case, I go to my, my mother, she is great. You know, my, my father has unfortunately passed away seven years ago. My mother, she is great, she's 83 years old, but she was a teacher, obviously. And she said, you guys, me and my sister, you need to have only best rating. Otherwise, what other people would say? And I'm like 60 and still in my mind, there's sometimes like, oh, I don't want to disappoint my mother. But at least now I'm aware of that program. I'm like, oh, shit, you know, no. No, this is not. I go and I do it, you know, right? I, yes. I, I do it. You know? We all still want to please our mothers. That's how it, how it works. Yeah, that's, but that's fine, you know, right? That's, that's fine. <laughs> what would be good, guys, because there are many of you on the, on, the, on the call, on the live, if you can put in the comments what kind of a major risk so far you did in your life, you know, and how it went, you know, how, how was it, you know, right? Yes. That would be, that would be great, you know. Absolutely. And, yeah, and on the flip side, I also want to know what risks do you kind of want to take, but you're holding back for some yeah. reason? Not, because not... here's the big thing. We all need permission from each other. And this is why I said earlier, there are so many times in my life, let me tell you, I wanted to start a business in coaching. I didn't have a psychology degree. I studied political science. Do you know how many people supported me and said, yes, that's a great idea. You should definitely do that. It's a big round zero. Everyone said, Coaches, nobody takes them seriously. Oh, you're you're too young to be an executive coach. You're too female. Everybody wants men like Jan to be their coach. Um, you don't have the psychology background or you don't have a network in Switzerland. Every reason why I shouldn't, everybody was there to tell me those reasons. <laughs> no, and, and, then, I yeah, and then, that's great because to, to be honest, for me, because I was like traveling and I have a network, you know, abroad and in Czech. But for Lisa, it's really pioneering because she came to Switzerland. She is originally from U.S., you know, uh, yeah. coaching, very new for her. And then there was like no network at that time. But you go, I, I guess you go like step step by step and you apply because you are a very communi co communicative person. So you apply your best on this, you know, issue. And this is it. You go like step by step. But that's it. I came to Dubai, right? And I just said, okay, I want to meet people. How do I start meeting people? I asked people, hook me up, tell me who's in your network. Who should I know? Who should I know? I started reaching out to CEOs of major conglomerates, organizations. Yeah. You just send a message on LinkedIn. Guys, nothing bad will happen. The worst thing that happens is they don't accept exactly. your LinkedIn request. Who cares? But now I have coffees with people who should have been unapproachable. But I had the audacity to reach out. What's the worst? You know, that can you, mentioned, you mentioned one thing. I don't want to push LinkedIn because yeah, it's a Microsoft product. But in, <laughs> in general, LinkedIn is a like business, you know, social network. But if you think about it, if it, if we take a, if we talk about risk and like approaching unapproachable people, right? Thanks to the social networks today, you can basically cut the middleman. You know, right? The people who would be exactly. like holders. Hey, no, no, no. You cannot talk to my boss or whatever. You can go like directly say, hey, Joe, you know, we may we may meet somewhere. And those people, I think majority of the bosses are quite approachable, you know, right? And uh, and they, they, they will do that, you know, as you said. Absolutely. absolutely. You just have to show up with the confidence in yourself yeah. to believe I belong there. And this is what people don't get. And other coaches always ask me like, my God, how did you build this business? How, how were you able to do it? And I said... I just go for it. Every time I go for it, I learn something new. I take a new course. I read a new book. I coach a new person. I, you know, I'll coach an athlete. I'll coach a business person so that I have cross functionality, always learning, always taking risks, exactly. always trying something outside the comfort zone. Uh, you said, you said one thing, which I think it's connected to, you know, uh, our ability to take a risk. 
and that's the sense of belonging there already okay yes. because guys that there is something which is called imposter syndrome that's a very bad thing it's like we, we all suffer from it though everybody, everybody's <laughs> suffering a bit but listen this is mind blowing number 60% of the students in the first you know year at harvard they think they don't belong to the harvard to get to the harvard is very very tough you know it, it's really you know tough but if you feel like I have this, I got this t-shirt two years ago. I address in, you know, San Francisco, NASDAQ. They got the entrepreneurship uh, center there, like innovation center. And I address like 300, you know, entrepreneurs, right? And I was like, absolutely. It was a good presentation. I was fine. But then, you know, the, uh, the vice chair of NASDAQ came to me and said, Jan, in the room, there was probably between three to four billion US dollars of the value already. And I was like, oh, man, oh, man. And <laughs> I tell you what, guys, if I would know up front, I would be probably scared a little bit. I, but I I was like, hey, those are some, you know, people, but they were really like serial entrepreneurs already, right? And they, they were quite, you know, rich. And they, the, the companies, you know, they were rich. Okay, let's let's go. Karen Isabel uh, Knopp, what is said about all the things that Lisa shared about people trying to talk her out of her possibilities that we are not only good at limiting ourselves by being risk averse, but also we want others to be risk averse. Perhaps it's because when others take a risk and succeed, they make us look bad. I absolutely agree. I absolutely. This is very good. Uh, Karen, this is this is very good, you know, point because we have something which is called mirror neurons, okay? And we mirror other people, but also other people are mirroring us. That's why, like, all emotions and everything, all behavior is, you know, mirror. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And very often it's like, hey, if we are, like, risk averse, you know, uh, other uh, we, we want other people, like, our, you know, if, like, if I'm the boss who is really scared to take a risk, my people will probably be the same because I will, you know, punish mistake or, you know what I mean, right? So, yes. and that, that's, that's bad. Obviously, you need to take, uh, like, reasonable risk, which should not be crazy, but uh, this is it. This is absolutely right. I agree. Yeah. And I see Karen, she, she's actually an executive director over at Harvard. So she really knows what she's talking about here. Yeah. I see this a lot with leaders. We talked, Jan and I talk a lot about A players versus B players versus C players in organizations. I see this leadership style a lot when people are nervous someone else is going to come and outshine them. But when we're talking about friends and family, oftentimes it's people who actually we know and believe they care about us. They're yeah. trying to save us from being hurt or, you know, from being disappointed. They're trying to be helpful. And we actually tend to believe them more because we believe their intentions are pure. So it's actually just the opposite. You need to know and be so grounded in yourself that you say, I can do this, and then they'll come around. I promise you, promise you, once you're already successful, everybody says, yeah, I knew it was going to happen that way. I saw it. Exactly. Like, exactly. In hindsight, they rewrite the story to know you were definitely always going to be successful. Yeah, so just, I agree you know, have the courage to say, okay, for one year, six months, whatever, people are going to say, I don't know, I doubt it, I'm not sure. And then you, they'll all come around. Right? And, and guys, the Rome, Rome was not built in one day. So it's really like step by step, you know, right? And and build it. And once you will build that confidence, I, I for me, it was really when I realized, hey, I should mind my own performance. I, I, I don't know what, you know, Google, Apple or other, you know, companies will do, right? But I can influence what I can do. That's what Stoics were, you know, saying, right? Once I realized that I really switched from that fixed mindset to the growth mindset, hey, be more of who you are, like every day, you know, this is it. And the same with, like, you know, my, my teams. I'm not saying that everything, you know, happened immediately. But it's like step by step. And I think curiosity as such is helping a lot. The issue with curiosity is we as a kids are very curious. But once we are in the school, school is teaching you how to answer questions. School is not teaching you how to ask right questions. You know what I mean? And, and the risk and that view, like the broader view, is really in, in, the, 
in the question. Okay, let's go, Mika uh, from from Finland. Main risk I took was leaving an office job to move abroad without prepared work <laughs> position there with money for one month's rent without proper English skills. The best decision I have done so far. Yeah, you see, uh, this is it. But you know, I think Mika needed to believe in himself hey it can you know happen if it would be go then and say hey i've like one month you know and no no english what i will do then no you think about what you can do <laughs> you don't think about what you cannot do and then you you build on it you know right step by step absolutely exactly just exactly that's the thing but people don't know is how to be so committed to a dream that they go all in to make it happen when you can get yourself so excited and you go all in you will be amazed what you can actually do most of us do not use our full capacity physically right. you know mentally emotionally we we cut ourselves short to try to minimize loss but then at the end of our lives we're kind of unhappy because we didn't really live our lives and the reality is when you really, really give it your all, I have seen so many amazing people do amazing things, fundraising, right, for non-governmental organizations, exactly. taking on new causes, leavings, going to teach English abroad, um, whatever it is, when you commit, after that, the details can work themselves out because that's what they are. They're just details. All and you need your, is the courage to come out. Absolutely. And guys, your if you think that your ability depends on whether you are, you know, introvert or extrovert, it's absolutely bullshit. It's a nonsense, you know, right? I tell you, I give you story of one great introvert, okay? Steve Jobs was fired from, you know, Apple. When they asked him to arrive, Apple was absolutely in a bad you know conditions right at that time i remember microsoft bought like 30 percent of the shares helping you know steve jobs a little bit it was year 2000 okay year 2000 you know right but he built on that and you know in 10 years or 11 years he passed away i think 2010 but now apple and microsoft are the biggest you know companies on the stock exchange and the rest is the history right it, and it, he was an introvert obviously he needed if i compare some extrovert to steve jobs there's even book about it how steve jobs was like preparing his speeches okay if you are introvert you better prepare your speech ahead a little bit because it's taking energy from you more than from the extra but this is it other than that like if you take like risk taking the ability to communicate whatever is the same maybe if you are with a lot of people and you are introvert, you are, you know, more tired in the evening. If you are extrovert, you are alone, you are more tired in the evening, you know, because you are taking energy from the other people. But it has nothing to do with the fact whether you are extrovert or introvert. Uh, this is it. It was a huge, because, you know, Jobs was quite successful and it was a huge risk for him to go. Obviously, it was his, like, heart because he was one of the founders. On the other hand, it was relatively, you know, risky. And he did excellent job. I mean, and and again, I you you need to take it. I, I was all my life Apple competitor. You know, right? I'm now I'm now like I, I have still Microsoft software on all devices, but like computer is Microsoft computer, phone is Apple, so everything is you know mine. <laughs> but this is it. But good good point, Mika. Good point. You know, right? So yeah. Barbara Barbara is saying thank you. That is really great advice, just to be bold and contact the person straight away. I, yeah, I absolutely believe, guys, what I did, you know, right? Well, I, I give you one trick, okay? Whenever I spoke, because I spoke to many politicians and kings, whatever, and even, even at some, you know, conferences, I try, because before the conference, right, before the speech, like, you know, some people are around this, you know, key person, but not that many. So you go there and you talk to that, you know, person and you try to figure out what are like common denominators. Maybe we have some friends together. OK. Right. Uh, or maybe we have some, you know, common agenda because after that, there will be a lot of, you know, people. And you you build contact like that and you ask that person, hey, can we get in touch in on LinkedIn or whatever? And, and, and this is it, you know, right. A, and you can build really like direct now you can it's you know network it's in your hands and don't wait because i have a lot of people who are like hey yeah 
give us some good contacts because we just lost the job. It's too late. I'm, I'm, I'm like helping those people for sure, but it's too late. You know what? I have like 21,000 people on LinkedIn and on the other like 30, 31,000 on, uh, you know, uh, Instagram, 50,000 on Facebook. Anyway, anyway. And it's like, not that I, I would say, hey, if I'm losing the job, I need to. No, I'm building it because I'm interested in those people. Some people are hopefully interested in me. We are building those, you know, bonds. And today, th this is a great opportunity we have today to be really in touch with interesting, you know, we, take just uh, the, our community on the Harvard, you know, uh, uh, IOC, the, the International yeah. Coaching Institute. It, it, it's, it's absolutely uh, fantastic. Yeah. And the, the other thing that I would say is don't be afraid to ask for friends of friends. So a mm. lot of the major contracts that I received in the beginning was right. I asked a friend, what, you know, do you know someone at Siemens? Could you introduce me to this person at Boston Consulting Group? Could you, right? And what, what, what do they care, right? No problem. So exactly. as you're building your reputation, you just ask. The worst that happens is they say no. So many of us feel scared. So many of us want to say like, oh, I don't want to put them out or I'm not sure if my offering is good enough or what, what would they want? You know, I'm young. Yeah. What, why would they want me? All bullshit. Just go for it. I, I agree. And it resonates very well because Lisa, she introduced me to Michelle. Michelle is Scottish living in Switzerland, which is interesting combination. <laughs> but anyway, I did with Michelle probably seven, eight speeches already for her clients and a good, you know, like the financially and the good quality of the clients. And we still continue, you know, right? This is one good example, in fact, you know, exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And but don't be afraid to ask for it. Don't think, oh, I have nothing to offer. Just the opposite. I know I want this person. I'm going to set the goal in mind. So I went to the Forbes list of uh, business women in this region in Dubai, looked up exactly. the best ones in the UAE. And I said, that's who I'm going for. Go for the gold. Right. And then I said, OK, so if I'm not interesting to them, how do I make myself interesting to them? So it's not about, oh, I'm too scared. I'm not. I couldn't look at the problem clearly and then solve for it. And then you use your influencing skills to make it so that they want to talk to you, right? This is what I mean by have the audacity to show up, to, to clearly and calmly think about what do I need to do to show up at my best? What do I need to do to influence people, to have them kind of say yes, right? You're saying Steve Jobs. I mean, hey, he tried to get a Pepsi executive to come to Apple. And the guy was like, no, why would I leave this great job and take a risk on this Apple startup? And he's like, you want to sell sugar water the rest of your life exactly. or you want to make exactly. a difference in the world? Exactly, exactly. You, you know, once you will start, you will help other people to start to think in a different way that was the the same what was the john what was the name of the uh pepsi guy john anyway i i don't remember yeah but uh, yeah th this is it this is absolutely true and guy remember one thing i'm now 60 years old so i have um, uh, quite few you know good experiences and bad experience and i made a lot of mistakes obviously in, in my life i did a lot of things well but general comment we tend to underestimate ourselves and we overestimate heavily the other people yeah. <laughs> this is it you know right so you may think like if if, if you will try to approach such person you may say okay he's great in that 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 but first i give you an example okay bill gates was obviously much better in technology than me you know i think in the in the vision and stuff like that but where i was better than gates was you know knowledge of the emerging markets places like central and eastern europe what we should do in brazil china you know india and stuff like that because i opened so many new subsidies for microsoft so i i think i was a better and i could you know contribute how to what to do in emerging markets because it's very different from united states germany or or uk and that and that was exactly our you know conversations like that i was listening a lot around technology and stuff like that and what is the future looks like but then he was listening, hey, what the company should do in those, you know, places, right? So, perfect. Uh, we have uh, Veronica. You, we cannot see you anymore. <laughs> My risk, or oh, you may read it, you know. <laughs> 
my risk was I left my good paid job, was not inspiring for me anymore. And now I have a new job, which is great, a challenge. And I'm so happy about that risk. I also left Germany three years ago and came back to check. I was afraid, not sure if it's a good idea. There's less money. It's a different school system for my kids. But I'm happy now. And I'm around my friends and my Czech culture and tradition again. This is it. It feels scary, but I promise you, there's actually a brand new book out about regret. So I can say this, the newest, latest, greatest research says the top regret is that you didn't do something. Exactly. It's not that you did it, <laughs> right? So just know if you're worried, this is going to mess up. This is going to go badly. This could have repercussions. Go for it you will regret not having done it much more than you will regret having done it. Yeah, that's the, uh, the, the this, this, is the, this is the book from the guy who wrote a book about like how technology is shaping the world in 2006. Yes. What, what, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll find, find uh, out. Is it Dan Pink? Daniel Pink, Daniel Pink. I know him because we are in touch on, the, on LinkedIn. Daniel Pink, Used to be speech writer for Al Gore. Uh, I remember once we did something in the United States, like the big government, you know, for is he's, he's a great guy, uh, you know, he's absolutely a great guy. And and this I'm like looking forward to read the book. Uh Mika, help us. John Scully, sugar water boys on Pepsi. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> but uh, here's what here. must be said. That Scully screwed up, you know, Apple in a big, you know, way. There was another, I think Amelio was his successor. That was even worse. And then uh, Apple almost bankrupt, you know, right? And uh, and then uh, then uh, Steve Jobs came and he, he did an excellent job. And to be very honest, when Steve passed away, I was the guy who was saying, hey, now I'm like doubtful because the new CEO is a former finance guy. I don't know how it's going to work. And he's doing a great job, I must say. You know, it's like since uh, Steve passed away, it's like 2010, I believe. You know, 12 years ago. Uh, you know, right? So it, it is, it is, it is in interesting. And I, I, wa I want to make sure that we bring up a little bit more about this growth mindset yeah. and risk yeah. taking. And everybody needs to stop being so afraid of failing. Because this is actually what you said, Jan, your mom's a teacher and she said, you have to get good grades. And what we actually learn in school is, here's what you got wrong and that's bad, right? And here's what you got right and that's good. And if you follow the rules and you you know, yeah. tell us back what we want you to learn, that's and good. That, and here, is, here is the trick. In innovation, you don't follow the rules. That, I mean, exactly. Right, we have a rules, we have a laws and so on. But if you want to be innovative, you are not following the rules. I mean, as you said, if somebody would ask you 20 years ago, would you sleep in some strangers, you know, house, you don't know those people? No, no. But it's a huge business model. It's just changing like hospitality business, you know, right? Airbnb, <laughs> absolutely. The same with Uber, you know. Yeah, and that's exactly what innovation is. We look at the same things as everyone else. But we have the possibility to see it differently. That's why we have to actually be open to seeing, not just seeing what won't work, but seeing what could work, why it could work, how we could get past the obstacles that would work. But I also want to tell you, there's no innovation that's a guarantee, right? Airbnb was turned down for funding at least 100 times before someone said that's just crazy enough to work. Yeah. But if you look at, for example, Amazon, they literally plan on losing billions because they know we're going to try an innovation. Some of it's not going to work out. No problem. I agree. No problem. I mean, obviously, we do the best we can. We, we put it through a rigorous process. But then we assume still it's not going to work. Venture capital firms, they invest That's into companies. That's why it's called venture capital. It's a risk. <laughs> they assume... Eight out of 10 of the companies that Absolutely. they, you know, they see thousands of pitches. They pick the ones they think are the most promising. And they already know eight out of the 10 of these are going to fail. They know that. They don't care. That's irrelevant. But the, those two, those two are such, you know, big that they are like IPOs on NASDAQ. <laughs> right. But, but you can't know that without taking the risks. Yeah. 
let, let's uh, let's touch a little bit why sometimes if if we take a risk you know and we are not successful we don't want to risk anymore okay and it has to do with like self-pity you you try to victimize yourself you are like hey oh that it's not me i didn't get it from the god and from the parents you know it's bad come on you know if you would go like that you would not walk today you know right because walking is risky you know because you, <laughs> as a child you can fall even if you are drunk now you can still fall you know, right? so self-pity is not good at all because it's victimizing you so what is good how you can like kill your monkey in your brain is gratitude basically because their monkey will still tell you even if 10 things would go very well and one thing you would you would not do very well that day your monkey would jump on that one thing and try to like demonize that mistake okay gratitude means that you can take three things every evening hey this was even it can be very small like hey i walked the dog today and it was a great experience because the dog was happy i was happy whatever you know like three things why you should feel you know good and thanks for them you know right and if you do it you will you know positivity it works like compounded interest and that's the same with our emotions okay yes. you know more we are pissed off more we are pissed off you know more we are positive we are like you know uh putting that positivity in society and and the other way around obviously and it's like you know positive snowball and it's not like hey you know i'm great whatever no you can always say every day you can say okay this is what was going very very well this is what i should stop this is not I sh that mistake i should learn from and this is what sh should i start you know right and you you can go and step by step and if you will realize that, and it has to do a lot with risk taking once you are aware that you are learning most from your mistakes. I hate mistakes. Don't take me wrong. But I know it's like balance. Okay. I hate them. But I know that it's necessary. If I wanted to learn, it's necessary to make some mistakes. And I'm making like coaching those athletes or even executives. I'm making some mistakes and I'm very open with them. Hey, this is what we tried and it didn't work. You know, I'm like not, you know, God, right? Obviously. Well, once you 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 are like fine with your mistake, the nice peak peak of neuroadrenaline is generated in your brain, and it says like, hey, this is real important. I need to remember, and it has to do with your neuroplasticity, and that's how you can, you know, learn and learn and learn and learn. You know, right? Yes. Uh, yes. This is it. So, kind of the if I if I learn one thing very well from Bill Gates, two things. He always said success is very lousy teacher and he really meant that we're learning mainly from our mistakes and number two never give up never ever 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 give up you know because you don't know that you you may walk and you know during the last corner there is something big for you you don't you don't know unless you you try yes and i think what the entrepreneur community does so well but that corporates and sports I and agree. nobody else is, like we the entrepreneur community, for example, they have something called fuck up nights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, yeah. And they yeah. literally have people give speeches about all the things that they've messed up. Because what we're trying to do, everybody puts their best self forward. Look how amazing I am. Look at this accomplishment. I won this award. Uh, you know, I'm on social media looking my best. But the reality behind the scenes is always different, right? But people don't talk about that enough. So fuck up nights are really all about yeah. what did I make mistakes on? What did I Here's mess up? the idea. We still have like 15 minutes. Yeah. Let's do small fuck up night here, okay? That's what I I'm wanted to get to. With Jan. I fucked up big time, you know, 10 years ago when I ended up in the mental hospital. It was a long term fuck up because I was like recovering always my physical energy, but not necessarily my mental energy. I was working all the time, you know, like almost 24 by 7, I was not sleeping enough, you know, not having enough, uh, you know, uh, mental rest. And then I ended up in the hospital and cost that cost almost my you know life. It was really, really bad. That was a huge, huge, you know, fuck up, right? So Lisa, what did you fuck up? <laughs> and guys, Many things. How how do where do I start? Your own fuck ups here, you know. Don't worry, we are like small community. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm 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 so open and super happy sure. to share the the one that re so I have to admit this. I I like basically blank out 
my, my bad ones. I learn what I need to learn and then I'm just future focused and move on. But there's one that I really still haunts me. And it was um, a potential client. We really connected. It was a client that I really wanted to take on for, um, I loved what she was doing uh, in business. She was quite successful and I'm really a role model and had quite a lot of influence and power. And I really fucked up on the negotiations on the pricing. Wow. And it came to a point where it was in like, way or in a bad way? <laughs> I, let's say I stood firm on the pricing okay. that I felt was appropriate, but w- with some flexibility okay. on what oh, could Jesus. be included and stuff like that. And it came to the point where it was, it was basically like a no. And like, we okay. won't talk anymore. Although I'm very friendly and I was very nice oh, about yeah. it. Right. But the negotiation just did not go well. I still have not learned what could what I could have done or should have done better. Okay. But I do know that to go from being super connected to basically being like mm. cut okay. something happened went way wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so for me, obviously, this is something that I have to do on a regular basis as we're taking on new clients and negotiating pricing and stuff. So it's really present in my mind whenever I'm with another future client. Don't let that, you know, learn from that and figure out how to, um, I don't know, make the client feel that they're really getting value from it. So that was my recent fuck up because this would have been a really good client who could have introduced me into lots of places that were that are important communities for me. This is this is tough because, look, I have a strategy and I don't know whether this is the best strategy price wise. Okay, I I think I have, you know, based on what I know and so on, I have some value. Okay, and and yeah. And that value is relatively, you know, high for like one hour of my, you know, time. Okay. So I I do like, this is it, I do it full price. Or if it's some charity, whatever school, I can do it for free. And I do do a lot of things for free, right? There's nothing in between, right? And and I'm usually saying, if I would go lower, it would not be fair to the other clients who pay my price, which I think if you you don't feel that Jan is the right person, that's absolutely fine, but that's how it works, uh, right? And again, I don't know whether this is absolutely right or not. But interestingly enough, I was trained on pricing when I was like 35 years you know, old. I was trained on pricing by the guy who was a Swiss origin. And he, he said, Jan, you have some value and you should not sell yourself for below your value. You can do some stuff like pro bono. That's fine. But your value is your value. That's that's what I like. Okay. So, Mika, there with you. I strongly believe the people who were not born with a silver spoon in their mouth can reach even more than those who got it all without going for it. Motivation to follow all dreams is way stronger. I agree. I think this is it because, like, tougher, you know, conditions can, like, uh, Look, I, I was born in, it, we call it, you know, Czech Moravian Highlands, okay? And they are saying that people are, because the weather is not good there, that people are very strong, okay? And that's one thing. I was living, like, for 20 years in the village, on the countryside, whatever, and I and I think it has a lot of influence on you. It was kind of the, I, I would say, you know, middle class, family, whatever, you know, right? But uh, I think it it has a lot of value. Uh, it has a lot of true in it uh, because I think if if you have it, hey, on the on the plate, you every you 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 getting everything from your you know, your parents or or somebody else. This is not necessarily building strong, you know, uh, mental toughness and strong grit. So I I I feel like I have to speak up because many of my clients. Um, are like let's say for example here in in the uh gulf yeah. states it's a lot of family businesses so the father was quite successful and uh, rather unfortunately i've only ever worked with the father who's passing it down to sons sure. and it's an immense pressure to be as good as oh, big time big time so even though they were handed everything it's not that they're afraid to work it's that they're afraid in comparison to not be good enough I and agree. then as a protection, we often say, then I won't try. Exactly. Guys, here is, here is the, the point. 
Uh, as you know, I'm entrepreneur residence at INSAT, and there is a course for the family businesses. And it, to qualify there, there needs to be at least two generations, you know, right? Sometimes, very often, there are three generations. So very interesting dynamics. As you said, you know, that, that there, is a, there is a grandfather. Very often, it's founder, you know, right? There's a, another generation, and then, you know, the kids, if you will. I was invited three years ago by uh, Unicredit to Milan. And I was like coaching for four hours the the richest the kids of the richest clients of Unicredit. Okay, a couple of interesting observations. Number one, they were they behave quite normally. They were kind of the nice suits, yes. whatever, but nothing special, right? So they they behave normally. Then I asked them, how many of you will continue exactly the same business as your dad and mother? And I would say like 35 to 40 percent would say, hey, this is it. Right. I would say like 25 to 30 percent would say, hey, we will do something, but something different from our, and, and the rest, which was like 50 percent would say never, ever. I'll continue. We want to travel, whatever. So that's yeah. that's quite you know interesting. And I, and I have some, you know, friends with large businesses here in Czech. And they have also some issues with the next you know generation, because, as you said, the one thing is. That you know, young people now they don't want to be like 24 by 7 in those businesses, like no holidays, nothing, no travel. They want to have a you know good travel. That's number one. And number two, sometimes there are like big shoes to be fulfilled, you know, right? That's it. And they are afraid to be to be like fur, you know. So it, it, it is it is interesting. And, and comparison, this is why this is what we started with in the beginning. Oftentimes we're comparing ourselves and in saying, yeah, but they're better than I am, or this imposter yeah. syndrome, I'm not good enough. This and that. this is what holds us back from taking risks. Mm -hmm. I or the big thing that I see is I'll be ready when. Oh, I just have to take this other course, or I have to get a certification, or I need to have a certain job title before I can do X. Most of it is not true. <laughs> So please take the risk, go for it anyway. There's only so much studying you need, and then you need to learn in real life. Yeah, there is a great suggestion from uh, Mika. We may do it, you know. <laughs> to, we don't have enough time to for the fuck ups. How about to our own fuck up night? Let's do it. Why not? We have I a, love when, that. when we do the book with Simon, it's like um, or, April, I want to say. April. I'm bad okay. at remembering. Okay. Perfect. March, April. We can do it. We can do it. We can talk about like, let's talk about yeah, like mistakes and how mistakes are, you know, uh, uh, playing positive role in our lives. And then yeah. do the, the fuck ups, whoever, you know, wants to contribute. Oh, man, I'm going to prepare my list. It'll be like uh, a mile cool. long. And even, even this more. is the thing that people need to understand. Life, at least the way I look at it, is like a dartboard. You got to just keep throwing darts. Some hit the wall, exactly. some somehow fly exactly. backwards, some are, and some are bullseyes. And you know what? People will remember only the bullseyes. And they'll go, wow, you have four amazing, you know, you have a hit, you have a book, you have a, you had this job, that. They forget all the other stuff. So, you know, uh, yeah. Michael Jordan, he lost like 30% of the matches where he could make, you know, decisive point. He lost, you know, right? But we don't remember that. We remember only those, you know, grades like from the, from the, from the middle of the field, you know, right? Scoring. Absolutely. Exactly, you know, right? Absolutely. And this is it. You know, I, I think you you make a mistake, you learn, you move, you learn, you know, you move, right? And and this is it. Unfortunately, we are really like taught in the school because there is a rating, you know, right? Hey, this is the good rating. If you have like you know uh, written feedback, if rating is okay, if provided that you can get written feedback kind of, hey, this is what you, you're you doing very well. This is where you need to improve. My daughter, she was always in the British system in Germany and here in, in Prague, you know, and and I think it's helping also to build stronger self-confidence because this is what, what Carol Dweck talks about, that some universities, they drop fail rating F and they call it not yet, which is very in, yeah. interesting and different from your brain. Not yet means, okay, there was some progress, you know, there was some efforts. You are not there yet, you know, right? Or you continue. Yeah. I will say with my girls, um, you know, my daughter brings home a test. The very first thing I ask her is, what are you most proud of? Okay. 
and then she can tell me. I don't say, why'd you get this wrong? Why I said, what are you most proud of? Talk me through it. What are, what are you curious about? What do you want to learn from looking at this, right? We never talk about the actual results because that's right. irrelevant. The whole yeah. point of the test was the learning. So focusing on the learning, focusing exactly. on what you're naturally curious about, what you're naturally proud of, what you want to learn more about, and then we follow that. By the way, Mika is in in Finland. In Finland, when I and when I was working with the with the team for you know Matti Van Hanen, who was a prime minister like 16 years ago, Finnish school system they took the whole pyramid of the kids. Okay, the, the best you know the the middle and the and and the and the bottom of the pyramid. But what they what they have and this is the about growth mindset. They are saying we will move you on your best level. On your best level, it is about learning. Because look, if I'm like carpenter, whatever, I don't need to know that much, you know, math. It's the basic. And to be honest, you know, like I, I was running the business over 20 billion US dollars, and I was fine with the math from the fourth class when I was like 10 years <laughs> old. You know, right? Nothing, whatever I learned, integration and all of that fun. Differential stuff. equations. Derivation, no? it, it's great, and I never use it. You know, right? It's like. You know, it's really like, you know, you can add, you can, you know, this distract and you, you can, uh, you know, divide and, and multiply. And this is it. basically. Right? Yeah, it's perfect. But this it's is the thing. Learn those things, but, you know, absolutely. But to be curious and everybody needs to follow their curiosity. And that's true for adults. So obviously today we didn't have enough time to do our fuck ups, but I hope everyone's starting to get the sense for. Don't think about taking a risk. Think about how you're going to show up to your life and plan it and build it the way you want it. And exactly. to be really audacious and just ask for it. You will be amazed. When you ask for something, you're more likely to get it. And then when you get it, you go, oh, my God, how did I do that? Because you asked for it. Keep stepping up. We have something for our friend Edward. So you may yeah. take this one, you know, Lisa. I always look at risks in a social context. Very Social good. groups and individuals can act as amplifiers or dampeners of risks. This goes so far that one becomes blind and takes risks in a group that one would never take outside this group or company. Edward, we could have a whole session just on this. Exactly. <laughs> Where to even begin on that? I mean, in, in the 30 seconds, sometimes we, we are, as humans, we are really concerned with the group. And sometimes... We don't stop, stand back, really assess what's going on. We just kind of get can get caught up in what's happening. And risks are a social context. What we didn't even talk about yet is how to make risks feel safe. So I want to share two things. One is have a, a social safety net. I can take risks with my business or my career or whatever because I have a husband who loves me. I have a kids who love me. I have my family who love me. I don't have to doubt that. And so I know if I mess up, if I'm the biggest fuck up of all time, who cares? Big scandal in the news. They're still going to love me. And I've got that safety net. And number two, we didn't talk about, but I would love to share more with you is about fear planning. So you think about, oh my God, what are people going to say about me? So go ahead and plan it. What are people going to say about you if you do this? They're going to say this. Okay, and then what? Oh, but then this. Okay, and then what? What does that really mean? When you bring your fears out and you actually put them in the light of day, you look at them and you're like, actually, I don't really care what people would say. But you have to bring it out and look at it to know, wait, I don't, that, that's fine. I'm willing to take that risk. So start to plan out your fears and, and you'll see. Yeah. And then, then the, 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 the other thing is, uh, Edward, that I, and you are absolutely spot on. I see it with some of my athletes. They, they getting to the bubble before the Olympic Games, for example, only talking to like, you know, coaches and maybe the family and so on, but nothing, no media, nothing. Like Estela Ditska, she's a Olympic Games winner twice, you know, three times, in fact, twice in uh, in Pyeongchang and now once, you know, in, in China, in Beijing. And she is a typical, like, hey, it, it, it's individual, but she's, like, really in the bubble, not, not taking account anybody, you know, else or whatever. And she performs, you know, very well. Because she's saying, hey, I concentrate absolutely on my, you know, performance. 
and really all of the things does not you know matter right it, it really depends on what kind of situation you are but sometimes we are overestimating what our people are saying that's number one number two your amygdala does don't cannot distinguish whether this guy is really like you, you know professional and can give you really like some scientific driven feedback or whatever like the the the, the feedback which is you know based on reality right that's and or is it some you know uh, guy who never you know touched the ball and he's just you know saying it right but your amygdala is taking it hey this is it there are so many critical people but you never know whether on, on instagram hey those are, are those uh, like real people i they they have ever touched they, are they you know people from the sport business or whatever right okay what what you can do once you, are, you you can say okay let's first figure out who are those people behind that you know feedback that's when your you know logical part of the brain is taking over and then you can say okay that guy maybe i i'll just talk to that guy because he built like three olympic games winners but not the rest because it makes like no sense they have right. no clue right so this is it. it it is about like critical thinking basically right and in to me critical thinking should be taught at the basic school basically right the kids should because we should not take like what is in the media and the media unfortunately they a little bit you know like i don't want to uh, use any bad word but they are like they, there is a commentary and there are facts and they are mixing it very often yeah. okay Commentary means, hey, this is my opinion. It's absolutely fine if you let's say, okay, this is commentary. This is my opinion. The good media, like Financial Times, whatever, they still do it, right? But like the local media, like in my country, very often they mix it. You know, right? Like, this is like factual thing, and this is my comment, but they they mix it, and then you are like puzzled, absolutely. Yes. Okay, guys. Uh, That's it. It's uh, what, what midnight out of in Dubai, I believe, right? Is it midnight now? It's midnight, yes. Is it? It, it is only Friday <laughs> in, in Lisa's place. <laughs> guys, thanks so much for being with us in this, you know, quite tough time. As we said, we were like wondering whether we should do it or not, but then we decided to do it. We help people who needed, you know, our help uh, before, and, you know, our hearts are. Uh, uh, with the with all you know people who are like suffering uh, uh these days and we, we pray that, that that conflict will be you know ho over hopefully soon so thanks again and Excellent. we'll see you in 14 days thank you take care everyone bye